thing. Do you guys know Marco Gresnik? Yeah. He's, uh, I'm a huge fan of his and he's a fantastic dentist. And I think that uh, if he hears this, I just want him to know, like, he's one of my big inspirations through. He does work that he uh, does out of pure passion and invests his time and energy and research. And he's like a real leader in all these things. And I'm just really impressed with like pretty much all of you guys that do these, because one of the things I've been able to do is do my passion, but it is correlated with uh, success and finance as well. You know, like I'm rewarded for it. I don't know how I would survive here if it wasn't, you know, like I, I wouldn't be able to support myself and so on, but yet you see so many people across the world do it and nothing makes me happier, but I also hope there's a way that it all balances out and makes, you know, worthwhile so that your, your energy and investment is not uh, unrewarded. Welcome to our new podcast in which we uh, want to highlight bi biomimetic dentistry uh, with our special guest, uh, Dr. Matt Nijad. Uh, welcome, Matt. Um, I'll try to give you a proper introduction. You received your degree from the Herman Ostro School of Dentistry at the University of Southern California in 2010. Yeah. And you were selected for advanced training and ment ment mentorship in aesthetic and biomimetic dentistry led by Dr. Pascal Manier. And now you're even uh, an adjunct faculty instructor at the Herman Ostro School of Dentistry. Uh, you're the lead partner of a private practice in Beverly Hills, together with uh, Kyle Stanley and Mark Helm, where you have your own dental technician, uh, Paolo Battistella, a member of the Oral Design Group, and he's trained by uh, Paolo Cano and Shigeo Katoka. Yeah. Um, you started your own Najat Institute, a training and seminar institute in biomimetic and aesthetic dentistry. And you give lectures around the world teaching about biomimetic dentistry. Um, actually, I followed the predecessor of your level one and two biomimetic restorative dentistry training, um, which at the time was together with uh, David Alleman back in October 2018, which you now teach just by yourself. Um, the training gave me a lot of tools and insights to dramatically change the way I practice dentistry today. So I'm grateful for that. Um, I hope I mentioned most of your extraordinary accomplishments summed up uh, nicely uh, because it is a pretty impressive uh, record considering the fact that, that we're the same age, you're 35. Um, how did you reach all of that? Oh, you are 35, right? I'm just recently 36. So. Ah, 36, all right. You got, you got time. You got time. <laughs> How did you reach all of this? Um, uh, what is your, who is your biggest motivation? Okay, uh, first of all, intro was perfect. I mean, you nailed it and good job. It's probably the best intro I've had. Very thorough, appreciate it. You said the names of the, the, the trainers for Paulo so perfectly. You know, people can't pronounce those. So it's very, very appreciated. Um, my, I guess mentor, like good mentorship is what helped me. I'm the type of person that will put a hundred percent into whatever I do. You know, I've always been like told by people around me, you'd make a good lawyer, you'd make a good engineer, you'd make, you know, but it's because I obsess over things, you know, like I, I like to be the best, but not in a competitive way. It's I'm competing with myself. You know, I want to get like I always have this concept like I want to get to this place so I can relax you know get to the top and then relax but over time I've realized that's not how it works you know the best is a very subjective thing you know when you get there you still see more 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 you see like opportunity and better ways to improve so I've kind of embraced this mentality of always improving and become more comfortable with the idea that I'm always going to be putting this amount of energy, but it's just energy and good mentorship because no matter how hard I try on my own, if I didn't have a good start with my mentors, I would be reinventing the wheel. 
you know, like I'd literally be reinventing, whether it's trying to learn the biomedic dentistry that I learned from Pascal, my mentor, David Allman, my other mentor, or even my private practice. Like I joined a, a really amazing private practice in uh, 2013. And if I hadn't joined that practice and had um, Dr. Helms essentially mentorship, you know, he had started this office, I came in, he may not have specifically taught me dentistry, but he taught me things about how to run a business and I was able to take that practice and grow it. So I think, you know, an important aspect here is everyone needs mentors because if you do it on your own, I'm sure you can succeed, but you're definitely not doing it the most efficient way. You know, efficiency is my, probably my number one drive and all this thing I'm always trying to get more efficient. So I think uh, doing the hard work, finding the best path to get there, putting in the time, the sweat, and, you know, just realizing it never stops because I always said I want to balance more. I want to do uh, less work, more of this, but I keep finding myself just my, my personality, just gravitating back towards wanting, you know, it's like no one's forcing me to study dental anatomy or read an article. I just don't want to fall behind. I don't want to just be hovering. I'm not at a point in my career where I just want to like stay where I'm at. So as long as that drive is there, I keep pushing it. All right. So um, you, you, you were trained by Pascal Magnier um, in, in, in USC. So th does that mean that you always practice like biomimetic dentistry or did you do like a different kind of dentistry? No, that's a great question. So USC is one of, I think, no, for sure, like the leading US-based institution on adhesive and biomedic dentistry. So when I was uh, joining USC, I didn't know these things. But as I went through the program, I saw that there was a uh, a revolution of sorts where there's the faculty that practice traditional and then there's the, the faculty like Pascal that have introduced newer concepts that are backed by science and of course you know old habits die hard and people are very set in their ways but my formal education was biomedics okay I had the background in all of the things that you would imagine like amalgam alloy gold but we emphasize that biomimetic dentistry and adhesive restorations are key. Now we get to clinic floor. Of course, there's some faculty that you would work with when you're practicing on a patient that were saying things like, oh, does the patient know the onlays only last about four or five years? Are you sure the patient doesn't want a crown instead? And they would say that and you're like, well, I'm sorry, but that's not what we've been taught. And they go, well, this is the truth, you know? So you had to fight those types of things, but Ultimately, in dental school, I did 90% of what I did on patients with adhesive restorations. I did a few PFM crowns that I wish I would have done differently, but we had requirements and I had some faculty that just didn't believe that that was the right way. But yeah, I did learn and start practicing this way right out of school. So even though I did a few traditional things, I knew that that's not what the school wanted me to do primarily. And I also knew that it wasn't better or, you know, it was just to learn the history and to kind of know where we started and something that does work. And then I came out and I started practicing this way. So I always tell people like, I don't, I didn't have to like learn how to practice differently. I've had to face a lot of people saying like, oh, are you sure this will last? Are you sure that will last? And so on. And I'm like, this is how I learned. It's like how I've always been practicing. It wasn't scary or hard for me to do this type of dentistry. It was more revealing to find out that people are scared of it because I'm like, wait, hold on a sec. I just went to school. I paid all this money. I had great mentors, great education. And no one told me I should fear to do a margin and elevation. You know, it was in my program to do that you know so yeah it really is from the day one of my practice i've been practicing biomimetic okay cool um i just want to bring up a, a photograph that uh, actually started for me the uh the whole biomimetic dentistry i'm not sure whether you're able to see this now yeah i can yeah yes. it's a post you you made in uh, august 2017 and uh, i was um overwhelmed by by this picture and, and <laughs> made me 
uh, realize, okay, there's something into this because you didn't do any uh, endo, you didn't do posts and crown, uh, posts and core on this, on this too. Um, and I remember you brought this up in, uh, in, the, in the training uh, I had with you in, in Los Angeles. Um, and you mentioned that this tooth, the, 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 the crown was still on it and the tooth was still vital. And my first question is, is it still vital and is it still on? Yeah, so, so let me tell you the story for this one. I just saw her. I did a, a good lecture at the Academy of Operative Dentistry just in February. And I pulled recalls, including this one. I got her back in. And um, it's going on, I think, just shy of three years now, okay? Like very close to three years. And so how this patient came to me was she was referred. She had, you see the top picture there. She had a temporary on top of that that was bonded on. They did like Luxatem and they tried, they put adhesive on and they bonded it on as a temporary and said, you're going to need to get endo, post, and uh, crown lengthening or something like that. Okay. So she was referred to an endodontist down the hall from me and he said, hmm, the tooth is vital. He's like, I really don't think we need to do an endo here, but I understand the concern because there isn't much tooth left. He sent her to me. I took a look at it. I said, of course, we can do this. And it's what's scary for me is when I look at this, I see beautiful opportunity. I don't look at this with any fear or doubt, but it makes me feel weird that so many other people look at it and go, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, what do you guys see? I just see like a normal restorative scenario here. It doesn't scare me. But I talked to the patient about it and she was so happy, but at the same time, like too good to be true. She's like, let me talk to my orthodontist. She had been doing some orthodontic work too. And he came down to my office. He drove down and said, there's no feral. There's no this, there's no that. How, how are you going to do this? And I'm like, hold on a second, hold on. You know, let me explain this whole thing. He's like, it's not going to last. I'm like, I respectfully disagree. And we did it. And yeah, it's been great. And you know, like I've showed this to Pascal and I'm like, Pascal, do you ever look at this and doubt anything? Do you look at this and go, hmm, like it's going to uh, be a tricky one or the prognosis is guarded? And he's like, no, this is just a normal thing. Because honestly, look at that carefully. That has two, like that has two millimeters of ferrule almost everywhere. My buildup was like a proximal, just to kind of smoothen out some carious areas. I didn't add much height to my buildup, just a little, but I still had like two millimeters of ferrule anyway, and then immediate dentin sealing and adhesive retention. So going on three years and I put this in my endo treated lecture because it's an example of a tooth that would often get endo treatment, but could also be avoided. Yeah. What, what kind of crown did you put on a felspatic or an, an Emax or a lithium disilicate? I put lithium disilicate. Um, that one specifically was probably Emax. Right now we're using GC Lissy a lot. Um, I still like Emax too. It's really the, the driving force for me is my ceramics. It's not like a, huge preference for me one or the other you hear some people say that you can make lissy look better you hear some people say that you can if you know how to work with emacs it can be just as good or better it's whatever the technician i think but i like a lithium disilicate for these because i want to have maximum rigidity to a reasonable extent, not zirconia because of bonding limitations, but you've lost so much tooth structure that your goal, see, cause some people might say, why don't you do a taller buildup so that you have more retention, you know, like build it up so that you have three to four millimeters of axial wall height, but that's missing the point because your retention comes from adhesion. And whether you do a buildup for adhesion or your crown does the adhesion, what you also want to do is restore the crown's rigidity. In a case like this, you lost circumferential enamel everywhere. So restoring maximum rigidity, the studies show it's best to have a smaller buildup and a larger amount of ceramic to overall like overcome this tooth that has more deformation potential. So you want to kind of minimize that, but not to the extent of doing a post because some people will say, oh, you got to put a post in there too, so that it's even more rigid. No, not necessary. All right. Talking about your technician, he practices, practices the technique of mimicking uh, mimicking the natural tooth layer, like the enamel, yeah. the dentin, and the, the DEJ. Yeah. 
uh, with yes. ceramics in, in their own natural thickness and optical properties, um, yep. according to the principles of Paulo Cano. Could you elaborate a little bit more on this subject? Yeah. Um, hang on a sec. I'm going to grab his book real quick. All right. <laughs> You got to keep these things handy in the living room. So we have Keep It Simple, a layering book on ceramic where he describes, um, it's maybe hard to flip through, but he describes the concept of trying to mimic enamel dent in DEJ um, with a concept of using the refractive index of enamel and dentin and trying to mimic the same potential. What's tricky on ceramic? Um, a lot of top technicians will tell you, let me ask you this question. This is a really good question. If you had to pick, do you think that in terms of optical properties, uh, enamel, sorry, no, uh, acrylic, composite, or ceramic, which one do you think has the best potential to mimic uh, tooth structure in optical property wise? I'm not sure. I, I would guess ceramics, but... Yeah, I would, I would as well. Yeah. Okay. Reality, acrylic number one. Okay. Really? Great. <laughs> number two, composite. Number three, ceramic. Ceramic. It's yes, exactly. Because the actual materials have like composite has some of these composites have exactly the refractive index of enamel. Um, ceramics have to mimic the optical properties of tooth. They don't exactly have the same refractive index. You have to put lots of powders to try to mimic the colors and so on. Um, top technicians I know, for example, Pascal's brother, Michelle, if he hands you a layered acrylic tooth, it is going to blow your mind away. Like the way, you know, you, you can, you can do it opaque, but you can also do dentin like opacity, layer it with enamel like and with just very minimal internal stain, like very minimal, you can get the most beautiful optical properties. But there's, of course, downsides to the porosity, but it has to do with the way the monomer structure is, and how it's closer to mimicking think about enamel with the tubules and you know, how it's basically, you have the rods and then the space between the rods and look at ceramic, it's not the same you don't get these type of prisms going on mm -hmm. but with acrylic and the way the monomers link up you actually get a very close uh duplication of the refractive index so in in telling you this my point is that it's a tricky thing in ceramic you know it's usually not the concept is not usually to layer like enamel and dentin it's to do either monolithic and stain or to do some layering but to you have to do some tricky things like make your dentin uh, layer a little underdeveloped and leave room for putting extra layers of like um, I'm trying to think of the word like uh, opalescent dentin and lots of extra powders to create the same effect so he describes in this book using materials because some of the ceramics are getting closer to mimicking these things so he describes how you can do um, materials and layer them more naturally just like enamel and dentin to get the best result and we try to use that a lot but of course like when you get to like a thin veneer or something like that now you're just dealing with the enamel layer and then it becomes very tricky because you still need to like mimic the dentin but you're already on top of enamel and you have very limited space so it gets tricky to do those things okay um Speaking of that, what is in, in, uh, normally your, your, your choice of material? Is, is it composite then or is it um, mostly ceramics? Mostly ceramics for, um, for other reasons. It's not, it's like in pure, in terms of pure aesthetics, like even like when I, when I finish polishing and everything, because one of the things we're working on in ceramics right now with Paulo is getting that perfect polish because a lot of people end up doing too much polish, too much glaze. It looks very unnatural, right? If you, if you look at a tooth in your hand, a natural tooth, it's not like glowing, you know, it's like, it's smooth, but it's not like wet and glossy until it's like wetted, right? Until it's in saliva. So composite, I'm able to create that shine very well. Ceramic, you can, but it's tricky. We're working on figuring out the best way. I've seen it before. 
like with some technicians, I've had cases where it's like, wow. And some cases where it's like, hey, the last one was better or shine, but we're trying to make it more consistent. But ceramic is still my preference when we're dealing with more than one or two teeth, because for all the different reasons of one balancing, like you're doing six teeth, if you're doing all composite, you have in the mouth, you have the challenge of trying to keep consistency and control. And then long term wise, I always say composite has more maintenance. It can look beautiful, but it has more maintenance, right? It's like ceramic, if it's done well, has less maintenance because it's a higher modulus material, more wear resistant, more stable. Composite over a 20 year period can still look good, but it does need more maintenance. I'm not saying like it's gonna chip and fracture way more, but it loses its luster. It's gonna need to be reshined and retexturized because overall like um, toothpaste and other, uh, just basically the oral environment, wears it down faster than enamel. And then ceramic is slower than enamel. So obviously, like, in you know, you get the benefit of, I think, less long-term maintenance if it's done well. Thank you. Yeah, um, what I wanted to ask you, you do a lot of um, uh, uh, aesthetic cases. Um, and how do you combine those aesthetic cases with biomimetic dentistry? Because um, uh, if we, we all know from Mayan's book in, in 2002, uh, he tells about the stress dis distribution in the anterior teeth and how the, um, the um, geometric shape of the palatal surface of the front teeth uh, makes sure the teeth are rigid enough so there's not a lot of stress distribution at the cervical side. But when we look at the posterior region, we know that there is a lot of uh, stress concentration in this in the cervical area. And if you, for example, do a, a veneer lay or uh, even a, even a, a veneer on, on on those teeth, you most of the times invade um, the bio rim um, because you uh, uh, there are a lot of people that have recessions, so you go past the the uh, the, the um, CG. How do you uh, how do you manage that in a in a biomimetic way? So for an anterior tooth though, or because you mentioned both, posterior, but both. For an yeah, both. Yeah. Okay. So um, when it comes to anterior, the way I look at these things is, you talked about the biorim, and the biorim is the concept of the one of the most important parts of the tooth for a posterior tooth, and also for an anterior tooth, is the um, couple millimeters near the gingiva so like having your enamel and dentin circumferentially even if you've lost like a worn tooth think of a worn anterior tooth besides the enamel that's worn on the edge the tooth if, if it's not thinned palatally and lingually just shortened incisively it's not much weaker it's a little more deformable but it still has its like circumferential resilience that comes from having enamel and dentin all around so you go to put a crown on that you've taken the biorim away yep. in favor of feral with adhesion you don't need to do that <clears throat> but when you veneer and you go there, you haven't removed it. So let's say you veneer the facial, you haven't yeah. removed or invaded the biorim. You've added, you know, you took and taken the enamel you had. Let's say you prepped 0.3 of enamel away, but you added 0.5. Yeah. Overall, you still had a biorim and you've added more thickness. So a lot of times we see in anterior teeth with the right um, approach, you actually have a tooth that's stronger as opposed to weaker. People are afraid of that and so on. Now, if you had, um, cervical uh, abfraction, erosion, something, then I would say same thing. You have, if you're doing something adhesive and additive, you haven't taken away the biorim. Yes, you're putting ceramic in an area that's known to be more problematic, but guess what? At the end of the day, even on a tooth, that's a problematic area, right? Enamel doesn't survive well in the cervical area under certain conditions like abfraction, toothbrush abrasion, et cetera. But would you rather let it continue or get back closer to the real tooth? So I, you know, I have no problem bonding to that. I have no issue. You know, I'll do uh, my veneer into dentin, no problem, even on the margins, because I'm able to mimic tooth. My goal is to mimic it and then protect it, which means like if the patient was having, uh, you know, really bad habits of using uh, hard bristle brush or being too aggressive, we educate. If it's from clenching, grinding, fix the situation that resulted in that. And the 
Same applies for posterior teeth. Like in a posterior tooth, the tricky thing is if you have a lot of enamel and dentin left on the tooth, but then you have a fraction below, you're constantly torn with, do I do like a crown or like a veneer lay that extends all the way past? Or do I onlay and do bonding separate? A lot of the times I do onlay and bonding separate. What I try to imagine is how much tooth would I have to remove to get there? One, right? And then two, so sometimes you can do it very conservatively. The tooth's already like shaped in a way where I don't have to remove anything extra to extend my restoration there. But if you think about it long term, one of the options I love to keep open is the possibility of doing some sort of uh, grafting procedure, um, pinhole or something like that. So I like the idea of, you know, you air braid and clean the dent in, you add composite. If the patient ever wants to get another procedure, they have the option. But if you put a ceramic margin there, you would have to try, you know, you can't do these procedures onto ceramic. You have to get back to the root surface. Now you got to damage the restoration, replace it, or try to shave it away and polish it. It's just not the same, you know? So I look at it, I offer to the patient lots of times what we choose to do is a composite in that area where the abstraction is and then stay you know above it and just leave it as two separate restorations for one tooth no thank you very cool. clear no and if you choose your composite uh, do you go for an aesthetic composite uh, and do you look at uh, at um, uh, at the uh, e-modulus of your composite uh yeah, so I always, all my, comp I, I don't, I try to always work with higher modulus composites. The absolute lowest one I work with is 12, which is lower, but it's, you know, when you look at composites, you'll find that the bulk fills, the flowables and the bulk fills fall under 10, you know, like usually yeah. we're talking six, seven, eight for like these bulk fill type materials. And then you look at restorative composites between 10 and 12. And then the high modulus composites, I say start at 12 up. Um, I don't know what other people would say, to be honest, but the thing is there is only a handful of materials that are above 12. There's um, some that are 16 through 20, but it's literally like, five or less. I can think of only three of them that are above 16. And then you quickly get in the 12 to 14 range. So I have 12 as my lowest. And um, that material, it's called Ina HRI. It's uh, by Mycerium. Yeah. I like it. It heats well. It's a good cement in some situations. And it's uh, really refractive index-wise. It's a beautiful composite. So I use that when I do direct anterior bonding for some cases. But I also very frequently just use APX for cervical and even for my buildup on a posterior like i'll do my dentin with apx and then i'll layer with something enamel like whether it's from mycerium or even um Another one I like a lot is Filtech Supreme Ultra. I'm experimenting, you know, there's a little bit of room to try things out and see how things handle, how they polish, you know. I'm really into that mode of not being set on one material right now, but for class fives, APX for posteriors most of the time because I can actually do it with one shade, especially if I'm matching root structure. Yeah. And as I work my way anterior, I'm probably gonna layer it more. And in that case, either it's APX and the ENA HRI enamel, or it's just ENA HRI dentin plus enamel. Okay, because the, the APX is pretty hard to polish on, on, a, on a high gloss to, to, due to its structure. So I can understand that you get a more aesthetic composite also in the anterior region. And if you cement your, uh, um, your veneers, do you use a flowable or do you use heated APX or do you use heated, uh, heated uh, mycerium? Mycerium. I use, uh, first of all, never, I've used flowable one time to cement, maybe twice actually. Once was a crown, once was a, a six unit veneer case. And the six unit veneer case was a study for myself. Like I literally gave the patient a really good offer. I said, they wanted two veneers. I said, how about we do six, but I'm going to use this. It's not it's not a bad technique, you know, but it's like, if you go anywhere else, they would be doing something like this anyway, but I wanted to see in my hands how it holds up and it's going on its fourth year. It's fine, but I didn't enjoy it. It, it, it didn't matter that it's like, Oh, it's runny. This, that. It took me longer to clean up. I felt yeah, more absolutely. uncomfortable. Like it wasn't, it didn't feel like, Oh wow. That was so easy. You know what I mean? Like it almost felt like uh, there's saliva, there's this, there's that. You know, I also did that case 
without rubber dam because I wanted to see how I feel about doing a case faster. I had this idea that maybe patients can choose, you know, like if I want to bring my fee down, I can say this is the gold standard, but you know, this is, I can still do the best I can under these. I, I hated it so much. I said, oh, no, I don't even want to do that. Like, I just felt like if one comes off, if something happens, it felt so uncomfortable that I said, nope, it doesn't no. feel satisfying or rewarding to me. So I use composite for every cementation right now. And for anteriors, for posteriors, it's almost always APX. For anteriors, it's about half, half. Um, the only down, th so APX is probably the best material in terms of properties, okay? Because it heats nicely, it um, has the higher modulus, which definitely makes it better. A higher modulus for your cement is unquestionably the performance, the winner in performance, okay? The only thing it doesn't do is you can't heat it forever. Have you noticed if you heat mm -hmm. it up, yeah. you have like, okay, yeah. so that becomes a workflow uh, issue sometimes. You're ready to cement, and you're like, shoot, that one's set up, you know, or like, where's my backup one? My assistant forgot to put it on. Whereas with uh, some other composites, including Mycerium, you can heat them for in almost indefinitely. I mean, there's a, there's a maximum in terms of like doing it, like they, the studies show like 20 times or more heating it, like the whole syringe, but you can heat it all day long and it's still ready to go. So, you know, sometimes I'm using that just because of practicality and uh, but the perfect material would be able to heat up forever yep. and have that and we're actually working on some uh so i say we another company is working on some of the heated gun materials and finding the sweet spot so that you can take whatever material you want and pretty much heat it i don't want to say instantly but faster there's some guns on the market but they still don't do exactly what we need but maybe someday we'll be able to just heat it on demand you know like yeah. if you have to wait three minutes it's going to be frustrating but if you can heat it up in 10 or 30 seconds and just dispense it right out that could be amazing yeah no yeah because um uh, i uh, i always use apx for uh, cementation but i once had a case where i had a really thin veneer yeah. Was zero point zero point three, and I broke it while in, while in, in, inserting it. So uh -huh. that's when I decided, okay, when I have a really thin veneer that's going towards the zero point three, I go for a flowable. But as you're as you're saying, I really, it's really annoying um, that it's runny and it, it it takes a lot of time to to clean to clean the excess while while the while, while your APX. Um, just if you if you wait a couple of minutes it's it becomes more stiff and you can just get it away with a probe and your yeah. blending is is perfect uh let me give you a tip so uh, other things i've learned in that case um what bonding agent are you using uh opti optibond or se bond it depends okay. on the case so things i've noticed uh little details so one thing is if you also heat the veneer on those thin cases and the composite it helps a lot because obviously okay. the minute the warm composite touches the ceramic, it cools down. Yeah. And if you keep them both together, you get quite a good difference. And the second thing is I still prefer to create my own flowable. So I'll take my composite and when I need it to be runnier, I add more adhesive. And the idea okay. is as you press, the adhesive is what's going to expel out the fastest, right? It's not going to yeah. all puddle. Like, you know, you're, you're making your own slurry. So I use a micro brush, put a little more adhesive. And for those, what I've noticed is SE Protect is a better diluting type adhesive. Try it yourself. Put Optibon FL, mix it up, try that. It feels a little bit more more like you've created like a more runny material that way. So I just dab it on with a micro brush. I kind of swirl it. I don't yeah. focus on fully mixing it like it's a whole paste, but like I'm wetting it with a lot of extra and then heating it up and putting it in. And I have two cracked a veneer, um, but what I traced it back to was not just the composite. In my case, we had some workflow issues with die spacer you know like for using composite it's very important that you have die spacer and you create yeah. like a cement gap and it's not all that uncommon these days for people to not do that on ceramic veneers they, they go with nothing oh it's going to fit the best if you do it with no die spacer you're not going to be able to use composite consistently 
because you need some cement gap. And that's not to say that it doesn't seat fully. It does seat fully. It's just you need to have that room to be able to push. If you push and it contacts the tooth somewhere because you have to push harder and you know, then it's going to create a little crack. I've seen it happen where like a little crack started yeah. halfway into my cementation and I'm like, be careful, be careful. And I push a little more and it keeps spreading and I'm like, game over. Yeah. You know, yeah, and just a couple of times, just a yeah. couple of times in my entire career. And it wasn't the beginning. It was more recently. The last okay. year is when I've had these. So it wasn't when I was first starting, but I did learn early. So first of all, in any case you do, even that thin, was it feldspathic also? Yours was feldspathic? Uh, no, 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 no. It, it wasn't Emacs. Okay. Um, yeah. Much, I was going to say much more forgiving with Emacs, um, yeah. but those techniques will apply to both, but even it's much more forgiving on yeah. Emacs. And another time I had a crack, I did a spot etching on my, um, on my temporaries. Okay. And then when I came back, I was cleaning everything up, air braiding. And when you spot etch, I spot etched and put a drop of adhesive. So it really yeah. sticks the temporary on. When I came back, I only noticed there was a little bit of adhesive left right before cementation. It really blended in. And I yeah. noticed, well, guess what? As I'm cementing right in the middle, too much pressure, a yeah, little crack. Breaks. Yeah. Yeah. I was able to salvage that one because it was so minor. I infiltrated it, but I was like thinking about it, it was just one out of 10 cracked and it was right there and I had seen it and it made sense. Cause as I was pushing right there, I was just, you know, it was actually contacting the ceramic and concentrating stress. Okay. Have yeah, you ever witnessed that a crack after, so during cementation, you didn't see any cracks and then the patient came back like a day after? Or, and you I have not. That, that is totally possible, but I have not. The only cracks I've experienced are ones I've noticed on cementation. Uh, it's a handful of them. It's probably three, uh, three patients, five or six teeth. One of them was numerous teeth on the same patient because it was die spacer issue, you know? It was that yeah. whole, so it was like yeah. four teeth on that patient. I even had switched to, um, I had even switched to uh, cement halfway through, and I still had the problem because the tolerance is very important. You know, like I, the people, I think the people that do these with no die spacer, it only works well if you're putting it in without isolation with all 10 of them at the same time because you know those people aren't pushing and verifying margins they're putting all 10 if they line up the edges or you know what i mean they're not looking mm -hmm. like yeah. i'm pushing even with cement i'm checking my margin every angle so even with cement i push harder than the guy that just puts them on puts them on puts them on because for them at the end of the day it's if they line up and they look seated you can't see any margin so if it looks seated you're you know set. it's okay so, yeah those people can probably get away with no die spacer, but if you're actually verifying margins, the tooth is extremely like isolated, you're gonna end up pushing a little bit harder. And if you have no space, I think it's gonna create issues. I checked with all my mentors, all the best technicians, and very, very much agreed that die spacer, at least one or two coats. Um, I do two, sometimes three, you know, coats. So I'm trying to get like around 50 micron uh, gap, cement gap on an anterior. No. Okay. Thank you. And, um, do you ever have to explain to your patients, um, uh, why you take longer, um, and that you're doing biomimetic dentistry or do your patients already know it because they come to you? Good question. Um, I always, when I first started, so my first day of practice was uh, in my own office. I didn't work for anyone else came out and I was very much defending that standpoint, right? Um, and over time, less and less, but I still like to mention it. I always mention that as a con to my patients, like, you know, pros and cons. I do this, this, and this, but what's the downside? You know, I'm like, I'm telling you all these things, the downside is my treatment takes longer. So if that's a concern for you, I totally understand. I just don't want to cut, you know, do the shortcuts that result in saving time because it doesn't feel good but to me, it doesn't feel rewarding. I want to do the best I can. But for you, it means you'll be more tired. You might be more sore. I'm going to tell you honestly on a veneer case, by the end of the appointment, you're probably not like, oh, that was a walk in the park. You're thinking that was brutal. And I'm like, I hate that. But at the same time, I have to do it this way. So if you're considering other options, keep in mind that I'm not the fastest by any means. And it rarely, 
rarely is a problem for the patients, but every now and then there is the guy who's like, I can't sit in a chair 10 hours. I'm like, that's fine. You know, you don't want to be having a patient in your chair doing something to them that they didn't sign up for. So if they don't want that, I think there's no point in having me because, you know, it's like, I'm not trying to be just a good ceramic surface. I want the whole package. So if I can't fulfill it, you pay a lot of money. If something happens, I feel like it's my fault. Even though you chose it, I feel like it's my fault. And I don't like that. I had a patient call mm, probably a week ago saying his veneer came off and I've been changing veneers one by one that he had done years ago. And I was like, my veneer came off because I'm always like every time a patient says, I've had people say your veneer, your onlay. And so far, 99% it's been the tooth next door or mm -hmm. one I did not do. So right. on this one, I'm like, Oh shoot. Did one of mine come off? Cause he's a heavy, heavy clencher, heavy grinder. I still would not doubt it except he's the one that would probably defy my rules, you know, and turns out no, totally different tooth. And I'm like, thank God. And that's the type of, the comfort I want. I don't want to be thinking like, right. I feel guilty if something comes off. I don't want to be like, Oh, they come off. I'm going to rebond it. Like, I don't like that. I like it to be secure and you can live your life. And there's a very, very, very low chance. Anything has a complication. Yeah. Oh. Um, and you also have your own, uh, videographer in your, uh, uh, um, in your practice. Um, and, uh, is he there all, uh, all day or, uh, only on some cases? Yeah, so if he listens to this, he's supposed to be there around 8 a.m., but he kind of rolled <laughs> in at like 10, 11, 12. At first, when I hired him, he said something like, I like to be the first one there. I'll be there at 7.30 in the morning. That's turned into 12.30. He rolls in, but he's freelancer for me, and I like that. The idea is that I don't need 50 hours, 40 hours a week, but I could use between 30 and 40, as long as it's productive. So he's my creative director. He comes in, he does videos. I have good, really good equipment, like really good camera, really good computer. He comes in, I give him some ideas, but he also invents on his own. And it's a, a great way to, for me to keep learning, marketing, all these things. But I learn, like when he does these videos i get to see steps and i have to explain steps like he's been videotaping paulo a lot so it's okay. pushed me no. to want to learn more ceramic too because he's like what do i label this what's he doing right here i'm like a good question let me go double check what he's doing right there so no. it's fun it makes it exciting and uh over time marketing is also important but my philosophy has always been don't market superficially don't be like all glitz and glamour without substance you know like i've always focused like i waited 10 years to push hard on marketing until i felt like my product my skills were developed and while they get better every day it's like i invested my energy into having substance and now promoting and unfortunately a lot of people it's like other way around get no. the market get the patient then i'm going to start taking courses because the money comes in and ethically i just had a hard time with that you know when you say things like i never like to say the best you know my, my catchphrase right now is excellence is my passion not the best dentistry the top and because because it's like, there's a lot of good dentistry out there. And what's, what's the best, you know, like my work is better this year than it was last year. And then every year I get better. So I just want to keep pushing the bar. Oh, well, thank you. Um, and, um, uh, you, you talked about marketing, but you also use, use those videos in your, um, uh, in your lectures, I, I, I guess, but he also documents a case from A to Z. If I, uh, if I understand co correct also for you, to check uh, how you did, where you can improve, right? Sometimes, so pa okay. patient acceptance is important. Obviously when we film, it slows things down. So yeah. um, from, from an interesting standpoint, one of the things I've started doing is uh, having people come to the office for mentoring. So I offer, I get a lot of requests for people wanting to come and it is definitely uh, enjoyable for me, but it's also like when I'm in the office, um, I have like my patients, I have my treatment planning, and then I have just administration. Like my staff is coming with questions. My office does not run on autopilot by any means. It's like, what do we do about this? What do we do about that? I got this email, this patient had this question, um, you know, uh, so-and-so 
called me. So I have all these different things. And when somebody comes to shadow, they're asking questions. I'm reviewing with them. And my staff's like, you are not, you're like for three days, you've had nothing done. And I'm like, we have a backlog of all these things. So now I started doing where people can come and we charge for it. And I have someone sign up. And what's nice about that is I can offer to the patients and even give some, Hey buddy, you got a <laughs> yeah. my, do you see mine in the background? No, no, I haven't. <laughs> oh, there he is. Nice. Uh, <laughs> totally asleep. Um, <laughs> So he, uh, so what it's nice is that we can offer some patients, like every now and then I get the opportunity to turn some of like my family and friend patients that I was going to be doing, you know, for free anyway, uh, into a marketing opportunity. Okay. So it's yeah. a great trade off. And then the other thing is he's really good. Like you said, for education, I'm not putting it in lectures that much, but I want to start doing some cases to like you know use for education so that's the natural progression we're in the early stages of that right now kind of developing full-on um documentation start to finish including like you know working through a microscope but there's so much to do man it's like it's hard to find time in the day you know just one step at a time if i if i try to do it I get overwhelmed when I think too much about when, you know, just one step at a time, a little better today than yesterday, a little better today. Uh, I can understand. Thank you. And um, is the competition hard in in Los Angeles, in in Beverly Hills? Uh, Supposedly, yes. And that means that, you know, we have a lot of dentists everywhere, but I guess I'm grateful that like, I don't feel it too much, you know, like um, when I put energy into growing, we grow. If I don't put into energy into growing, we hover. So it doesn't seem to be out of my control. Okay. It's not passive. It's definitely not just sit around, you know, like, and I, I guess in some markets it is like that. If you open up, they will flock to you, but we have a good base. And if we put energy into growing, we grow. And if we don't, we hover. So um, I would say, it's uh there is a lot of competition there and the thing i told you earlier about having a running start with like purchasing a good office and partnering with dr helm it gave us a good foundation it would take 30 if i was starting from scratch right now i honestly could not imagine starting from scratch in my area because it there's it's like just to even be heard to get rolling to cover the rent there's so much people do it and i'm impressed but i can't do that like i've never i'm good at business but not not to that level and i think it takes certain things that i don't want to do like a lot of insurance dentistry and kind of changing your your course of uh practice over a 10 year period you start with like more basic and you start but it's like it's hard i want to do the best dentistry every single day and if i'm contracted with insurance plans i can't do i literally financially cannot cover my expenses so i think the hard part in la is finding the right opportunity and yes there's competition but there's a market for all that stuff high-end cosmetic biomed and then there's still a market for insurance driven stuff that is meant to be uh, helping to get you out of your immediate concern, but it doesn't necessarily have to last forever. No. Okay. And uh, if I scroll through your Instagram, uh, especially on your personal page, there's a lot, a lot of anterior cases. If I look at your um, Madden Shout Institute, I see more posterior. Um, you're doing both posterior and anterior, right? Is there a reason why you're only posting the anterior cases or mainly the anterior cases? Yeah, because um, in looking at what I like to do the best, like, you know, I learned this a long time ago from another mentor and it only, um, it only made sense to me probably five years into my career. He said that he's a prosthodontist, he only does big cases, I said, do you do implant placements? He's like, no, I don't do implant placements. I said, do you do uh, what else? So I think I was asking him extractions, oral surgery, endo. And he said, he's like, look, jack of, jack of all trades, master of none. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you can do a little bit of everything, but you won't be the best at anything, no. you know? So he said, you'll get to a point where you're busy doing what you love, and then you won't have time in the day to do everything. I didn't understand it until I started to understand it. Like as I got busier, I'm like, I can do, um, I can do five posterior teeth or one anterior case, which one do I like better? And I'm still at a point where I do both. But if I had to pick one thing, my, my dream practice scenario is one or two patients a day, every single day, as opposed to uh, three or four 
four patients or even five patients or six patients and, you know, chopping it up. I'd rather do that. So I'm trying to f focus on it. And I'm also trying to get to become a center where I could have an apprentice, somebody like I didn't have the opportunity to, no one hired me, you know, like there wasn't a good practice. Like my mentor Pascal didn't practice in private practice. No. And there wasn't a place where I could go do this type of dentistry. I want to create an opportunity for somebody to do this type of dentistry and they'll be my, my, you know, right hand man or woman who will do the single posteriors or maybe even the posteriors on part of a bigger complex case that we plan together. I want to create that little by little, but right now it's about 50, 50. So why I separate it is because I want to focus my, um, my main uh, Instagram on what it is. You know, it's like you, you want to cast the net for what you're trying to attract. I want to yeah. attract more okay. and more because I interior. Yeah. And if I had yeah. to pick my that's what I want to do every day. You know, it's and it's not because I don't like posterior, but I like a lot of things in dentistry. But I if I had to pick one thing, it would be that. And I'd rather do one thing a lot and get amazing at it than to do um a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Like I gave up on endos very early in my career. I do yeah. no endo whatsoever. Yeah. Okay. And um, uh, I graduated four and a half years ago now, and um, I'm doing, I'm trying to do biomedic dentistry for a year or two. I'm currently in the in the in the in the mastership program with with David and Davy. Um, uh, but when I was on Instagram a couple of years ago, um, I didn't notice any biomedic dentistry and. Now these days, I have the idea that everybody is promoting biomedic dentistry. Do you feel the same trend that it's becoming more and more popular? It's becoming more and more popular because recent graduates, uh, first of all, social media and uh, the accessibility to information has made these things grow rapidly, right? Because without all this stuff, I think you would look at the guy who's saying they're doing this and think, oh, it's just a bunch of garbage. It's like just marketing. There's no substance behind it. But we're seeing, we're hitting like that critical mass where people know it's real. And then recent graduates, I think they see the value in it. You know, they, they're they noticing it, seeing that people they aspire to like be like, because we all have that, right? Like I had dentists. I wanted to aspire to be like as a student you're looking hey that's going to be me or that's what i want to do so they see people they aspire to and they see that they are doing this type of dentistry and they go hey i didn't learn this in school so i'm going to invest in it. i'm going to learn it now my only fear for these things is i don't have a monopoly on it. i don't want to have a monopoly on any science but i fear the people that capitalize on the opportunity of saying you know Oh yeah, I do on inlays and onlays. That's biomimetic. No, that's called adhesive. And mm -hmm. while nobody owns the term, out of like ethics and respect, you're supposed to understand that biomimetics is not just adhesive dentistry. It's more the pursuit of mimicking a tooth as faithfully as possible, not just doing a tooth colored filling. You know, there's a lot more science behind it. Yeah. So I, I'm also seeing a little bit of that where someone says, and I have patients that come and they say, I went to this person and they say they do biomedic on their website, but it's clear that they don't. And that that's, I've been saying that since the day I graduated, that's going to happen eventually. And I think it's only going to get worse in that regard. So like everyone has their own ethics, their own comfort level, but we're going to see everybody saying they do biomedic in the next mm, 10 years, probably. Yeah, because you have read over, yeah, you have read more than two hundred articles on the on the subject on, on on biomedic dentistry, and if you look on Instagram and you just uh, look at a at a hashtag of of biomedics, you also see a lot of people that leave decay and only do a nice fissure pattern, and then they call it biomedic. So, yeah, uh, yeah I can relate what you uh, what you're saying, and yeah, we we cannot claim the title, but it's important that that people know that there's a clear distinction between true. A truly true. biomimetic and only adhesive and fancy dent, uh, dentistry and not to place uh, the the thing we want to achieve higher as what the other one does but there is a clear distinction in to what biomimetic is and uh, and what isn't absolutely um, yeah it's, it's a it's a sticky point because i don't even know what to do but what i've learned to do on things like this is mind my own 
I'm just mind my own business, you know, like I want to like meddle into and then I realize why. First of all, it makes me frustrated. Second of all, I can't change people that aren't open to change and I'm not the police of anything. Do you know what I mean? So I try to just surround myself with more of what I want to do and just keep moving forward. I really, really try hard to stay out of the politics, the competition. I can't treat every patient in the world. We need good dentists everywhere. I feel... I feel terrible that when a patient asks me for a referral, there's only a handful of people I feel comfortable to refer to, you know, someone says, Oh, they said this person says biomedic on their website. It doesn't like, are you asking me would I go to them or does it seem okay? Like you can do your own research, but if I'm going to give you my recommendation, I want you to know that I would go to them for work. So I just try to mind my own and focus on, me and uh, developing things and then I try to also teach what I know so other people can practice this way and selfishly when I teach I learn more so it's rewarding for me to not only pass it on but to keep pushing myself to improve further and further no okay thank you uh mart I don't know if you have any any other other questions right now I don't know I think we've covered a lot yeah a lot so very grateful for that very good yeah. how about you guys awesome. so tell me how's it going let me ask you some questions so what's practice like you guys practicing together right no. now or it's no. separate we're really separate yeah nearby separate. no we live uh, around 160 kilometers apart from each other in holland, so in holland that's, that's a lot, lot. <laughs> that's a lot yeah <laughs> And um, are you able to do this type of dentistry and make it financially feasible or are you sacrificing a lot? Like, cause I've heard of a lot of people that will, you know, these are the best people in terms of their ethics and passion, but they will do things that they, they don't even make money for. They, you know, they, they can't even charge for Are you in the position where you do this type of work and you can't charge more than if you were to do it exactly, exactly. the same yeah 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 well, because we have uh in holland we have fixed rates um so that means that for an uh for the biggest composite restoration we do we can charge uh 94 euros um so that's not a lot i don't know how much it is in dollars it's a little bit more i guess 110 dollars or so oh my gosh uh, some, something like that i don't really know but it's 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 not a not a lot and um, it becomes really profit, uh, profitable if you do a lot of dentistry, uh, but do it very quickly. And if you want to focus on giving your best, then it takes then it takes time. For example, if I do a, um, a, a, an anterior restoration, I sometimes take up to ninety minutes. Or when I do a crown, it's yeah. it's mostly ninety minutes prep and forty minutes placement. Well, and that isn't really financially possible uh, but uh, i'm in a lucky situation that i don't have my own practice so uh, while other dentists around me uh, earn the money i can earn a little bit less and still the uh, practice stays profitable and healthy and i think that's important and they allow you so the practice you work at yep. allows you to yeah. be like luckily that. they do yeah yeah luckily they, they do what's their reasoning that they love what you're doing or that it's good marketing or just, you know, like if you're not profiting for them, what, how are they justifying allowing this? Is it some angle or some benefit to them? Yeah, we do, We don't really have any marketing here because we all have fixed rates. There's, there's, uh, there's no competition. Um, um, but um, I have, um, uh, I'm in the lucky position that I really like my passion and, and, uh, the way I'm approaching dentistry and I always want to excel uh, ex- exactly as you said I, w- I, I also want to excel at everything I do I, I, if it's cycling, soccer if it's um, uh, drawing, painting yeah. or dentistry, exactly. everything yep. um, so uh, I think it's it's the the, en- the, en- entu- the enthusiasm but also um, if they have a case that they are struggling with for aesthetics or something, they can always refer it to me. And m- maybe that's also a, a, a benefit. I don't really know. Um, but they are allowing me to do the dentistry I want to do. And I'm very glad for it because otherwise I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be happy because you were telling about um, the patient that calls while well, my facing or my crown has come off. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Sometimes I have the same that people call, yeah, and your crown has come off. And I thought, okay, uh, how? Oh, yeah, exactly. I, yeah, I, so I, I know I've, I've done everything correct. Uh, rubber, uh, on the rubber dam, 
air abrasion. How is it possible? And then they come and it's a tooth that uh, it's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or the opposite exactly. side. That yeah, doesn't even exactly. work on this side of your mouth, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Good, and you know? I, yeah, and I really like uh, the fact that for, for me, it's more rewarding to make a really nice restoration or a really nice case that I can always look back on and see the photos than oh, earning more money. Yeah. Because um, I really like the case and that's most important for me. Um, my mentor Pascal, when he would say he had the funniest little story about why do you put like stain in the composite groove, you know, like who's going to see a posterior composite groove. And he said that as I'm working, I imagine on my shoulder, there's a little Pascal just kind of like, what are you doing over there? And he's like, as you do, he's like, yes, yes. It looks so good. Rubbing his hands going, I love it. You, you can definitely rest assured you've done great work today. And yeah. it's that pride. It's that concept that like, if you like what you have to love what you do, you know, and if it makes you feel happier about it and photographing, it makes you like feel like a creator or an artist. Like a lot of us are, you know, loving the pursuit of, uh, becoming an artist or being yeah. like a creator in a lot of ways. So like, I think we do these things for us too. There's a huge benefit to patients because the guy who makes it look beautiful is also very likely to be paying attention to all the other details. It's hard to say I'm going to focus on just beauty and aesthetics and totally ignore marginal quality, adaptation, function, occlusion. You know, it's hard. It's not impossible, but it's like yeah. if you have to correlate them, they're very correlated together. So it goes hand in hand with the personality and everything. Do you guys know Marco Gresnik? Yeah. He's a, I'm a huge fan of his and he's a fantastic dentist. And I think that uh, if he hears this, I just want him to know, like, he's one of my big inspiration too. He does work that he uh, does out of pure passion and invests his time and energy and research. And he's like a real leader in all these things. And I'm just really impressed with like pretty much all of you guys that do these, because one of the things I've been able to do is do my passion, but it is correlated with uh, success and finance as well you know like i'm rewarded for it i don't know how i would survive here if it wasn't you know like i i wouldn't be able to support myself and so on but yet you see so many people across the world do it and nothing makes me happier but i also hope there's a way that it all balances out and makes you know worthwhile so that your your energy and investment is not uh, unrewarded. I think that is that is the 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 principle that we share is that, that the passion when you when you feel that you're doing something that is rewarding and and it's very fun to do and you you have a, a enthusiastic patient and uh, then the money gets less uh, important. Important. It, it also comes like the other thing I wanted to I guess say is I didn't plan how to make it financially successful it just kind of happened you know like i i did my first fillings for for us prices a filling to be uh like a posterior class one filling to be 30 dollars is cheap for a class two with a proximal 75 bucks is extremely cheap and i was doing these fillings i would do two class two fillings and it would be half a day for $150 and my assistant was making that like I have rent overhead materials and my assistant's making like 14 bucks an hour what does that come out to like I literally didn't make money but one thing le led to another I said always you know like in general like I guess do what you want make it into something that's sustainable there's a market for all these things there's a great concept uh, called the blue ocean strategy where you go and you don't try to fit into society's norms and boundaries and restrictions you go out instead of fighting everybody in the same same patient base same market same niche go out in the middle of the ocean far away from everybody else make the dentistry make the business the way you want and if you're passionate about it and if you put the time into it not always but it's often that the people that are most passionate and dedicated to something will find a way to succeed i think that sums up the karma philosophy pretty well so <laughs> that's a good way to enter uh, enter this podcast um you guys thanks thank for you. having me I appreciate thank you it very much yeah thank Great. you very much happy to see you guys doing all these things and i hope to uh 
continue to stay in touch with you guys. It makes me really happy and I'm really proud of you guys. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Take much care, for, for your time. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.